this is a middle aged male with uh, cirrhosis with uh, varices so this patient does not have esophageal varices uh, but uh, there is isolated gastric varices seen igv1 so as a result of which uh, with rcs and the patient had presented with uh, bleed so what we are now trying to do is we are trying to find out the uh, <clears throat> the locate the varices and then kind of uh, Dr. Kapil is uh, with me. He's going to help me out with this procedure. So what we are planning to do is first we demonstrate what are the, uh, how we see. So, so the steps for uh, endos uh, US guided uh, uh, glue and coiling of varices is first we need to instill water into the fundus. As you can see, we have already done it. And then you can, uh, this will give a much better acoustic coupling for the varices to be visualized. So these are the intramucosal part of the varices. Uh, Dr. Kapil, can you just give the flow uh, Doppler, sir, please, please for me. So here you can see all the varices. <clears throat> yeah. So these are the varices that you can see over here. Okay, so here you can see these are the small size honeycombing pattern is there. This particular jo vessel that you can see outside is basically is is an is a uh, is is a collateral. You can see the, you can see the wall of the gastric. Uh, you can see the gastric wall on EUS, which Dr. Kapil is going to point out now. So that is the gastric wall of the EUS. Yes, this one. So you can see that this particular vessel is lying outside that, right? So these are the these are the uh, collaterals. So as we hmm. paragastric collaterals. Yeah, paragastric collaterals. And as we try to trace the collateral outside, you can see this is continuous and coming to the uh, splenic hilum where there are multiple collaterals. Once we start going inside, we can see that this paracastic collateral is communicating and here is, the here is the part which you can see. This particular, yes, this particular vessel which you can see is actually communicating with those small varices that I just now showed you, right? Uh, you agree with me, Dr. Kapil? Yeah, yeah, Jender. Okay. So, so, for beginners, how do you localize gastric varices what are the maneuvers and already you told that you use water so, so once one thing is we use water the patient is in a left lateral position so whenever you instill water it gets uh, accumulated in the fundus and then you start uh, uh, locating these uh, uh, these acoustic uh, i mean anechoic structures which are within the mucosa of the gastric wall so you can see these are the varices which are intramucosal and predominantly uh, the gastric varix and coiling concept, the first was done by, I think, Romero Group. They did the first US guided coiling and uh, glue, followed by the, the major part of the coil plus glue concept was, was given by Dr. Kenneth Binmoller, the person who has invented uh, Axios. Axios. So, so he was the person who said ki, uh, the basic concept of putting a coil and glue is that what we do is uh, the coil acts as a scaffold <laughs> over which uh, once you put a pu push glue, then what happens is it forms, it forms a cast. So that actually helps in, uh, ha has two benefits. One, that the glue does not have the chance to embolize outside because the coil is will hold that glue together. And second is the amount of glue that is required is lower as compared to uh, if you had used only glue, right? Yeah, yeah. So all meta analysis show that co combination treatment is superior to single therapy, either coil, either glue, or even the thrombin also. Yeah. So now what you're going to do is, uh, I have already primed my... Uh, assistant regarding what are the things, what are the steps that we're going to do. So what we're going to do is we're going to puncture the, uh, we're going to measure this uh, varix. Is that a couple? Okay. Yeah. So we're going to measure this, uh, this particular varix because that will help us in identifying or noting what is the uh, uh, size of the coil that we're going to use. So usually what we use is uh, mm, the size is around 6.6 centimeter or 6 millimeter by the longest diameter will be around uh, 1.2 centimeters right so yeah. so usually the dictum is very simple the dictum is uh, 1.2 to uh, 1.5 times the size of the varix so that is what we use you can see these are the intermucosal varix and these are communicating back as I, as we trace back with this one this particular one so this is the perforator uh, vessel that we can see, and we're going to target this particular varix for uh, uh, for blockage. Okay. Any questions now, or we go ahead? I think we can proceed. Yeah, we'll proceed. 
So the steps are very simple. We puncture with a 19 gauge needle. Uh, it depends on, on the uh, size of the coils that we are taking. Sometimes if there are smaller coils that are required for vascular EUS, what you can do is you can sometimes uh, take a... Uh, we are using this nester coil. Yeah. If you can zoom, somebody can zoom, then we can show what is, how, how do we choose the size. In the meantime, needle there, no? No. So there are three parameters which are written on this coil. You can see there are three parameters, 12, 14, and 35. So 12 is the, you can see the diameter of the, of the loop, 14 centimeters the length, and 35 millimeters is the chan, uh, size of the coil, the, the whole length. So we have to choose, so since the size of this varix was around 0.6 millimeters, so we have to choose which is bigger than that. So anything which is bigger than 10 millimeter can be chosen for this uh, varix. And we have available 12 millimeter only, not smaller than that. So we are choosing that. So uh, the length will vary depending upon on this one. So yes. this is a um, moderate size because that's the diameter is around, what we saw on the long axis was around 13 millimeter. So that's why 14 centimeter can be chosen. And diameter, so 35 millimeter means we have to use a, uh, 19 G needle. It can't be go, uh, through a, it, it, it won't go through a 22 G needle because 35 millimeter is required, 0.35. Okay. So I think the, the the needle is ready. So it is a 19 G needle. It has to be primed with the saline. So this is one important thing that we need to do. Please take out the stillet and prime it with saline. So that is important. Yeah. Take out the needle, uh, still it completely, and prime it with saline because we do not want any kind of air or anything getting inside the uh, inside the varix or in the in the field. Yes, in this line. Okay, so once we have primed that, so then we are going to puncture. So that's it. That's is good enough. Okay, so we are inside the varix now. Flush. We can clearly see. Flush. So what we do is we we slightly we can aspirate, then we flush. So the blood is coming out. So we know flush. now we start flushing with dextrose or saline. So this is okay. dextrose flushing with dextrose. So we can see that the uh, saline is coming out. Keep the needle over. Keep the stillet over there. Keep it over there. Flush it and keep it so that by backflow the the water uh, the blood doesn't come back. That's good. Now so start open, open up the open. needle uh, coil, I'll keep, please. I'll keep on flushing in between so that it doesn't get blocked. Right. And then what we do is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, open up the uh, needle. Uh, sorry, the coil. So this is a uh, this is an O35 coil, uh, 14 millimeter by 14 centimeter. Doctor Kapil has already kind of told you. So we push the uh, coil from behind by using the stillet. So once it, it has gone inside the channel of the needle, uh, Mr. Ranjit has actually taken out the, uh, the, the holder of the coil and now he's going to push the stillet inside. So in order to deploy the now coil. we'll see the coil it will be like a, on usb yeah. you can clearly see, we'll be now be able to see that the coil is coming out can you see the coil coming out right so as the coil comes out i try to slightly pull back the needle slightly to accommodate the coil adequately right so the coil has been deployed move it uh completely deployed right okay so now what we do is we flush it again uh, okay so, and then we use the uh, Doppler to once again check how far it has going to got, got blocked. So, in between, I'll, we'll, I'll, I'll give a small, small helicot so that... Uh, mm, so, so, you can see almost, almost uh, a significant amount of the flow has decreased. Can you remove the Doppler, please, now? So, now what we do is, uh, what do you think, uh, Dr. Kapil? Yeah, do you yeah. think any more any more coils are needed? Or I think the let us see, let us assess. <clears throat> okay. So, now it is pushing glue. Okay. So now we are using glue. So one coil has already gone in. Yes, please. So now we are injecting glue. Be very fast with the glue and then yes. Good. Very good. So we have injected around 2 ml of glue and you can see the snowstorm appearance and uh, the glue has been deployed. So we, I take back the needle. Please make sure that the catheter is outside. 
So this is where we have placed the, uh, the glue and you can see that once that has been done, so there is no flow over here. And now what we do is we trace it to the mucosal part, right? Yeah, so we have to see that the, the blood flow should stop to the mucosal see, part. See, now you can see there are anechoic structures, but there is no blood flow in that. Can you see this? So, the, so what we have done is the part where it was entering, this part we have blocked. So once we have blocked this part, you can see these are the intramucosal part where there is no flow, where yeah, earlier yeah. there was a lot of flow noted. Yeah, yeah. So that will take care of this one. Yeah. So we are done with the procedure, I think. Uh, Dr. Kapil, you think this fine? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good. I think well we are done with that procedure. What we do is now the steps are very important to save the uh, scope. So we push out the uh, catheter as much as possible and then take out the scope in a linear fashion. Please. And then use adequate amount of, sorry, adequate amount of acetone. Hmm. Then acetone then. So we should be very careful about uh, this part because you know, where is acetone? You don't have acetone? Mm -hmm. Okay. okay so we'll take it out and then flush it with acetone. Yeah. Uh, you should keep acetone and all this material in hand because many a times what happens. Good. So needless come whether the whole sheet has come out. That means the injection was good. There was no spillage, hmm. and the scope channel is also working well. And the scope channel is completely working fine. Yeah, it is absolutely fine. Yeah. So I think we are done with the procedure. Uh, sometimes what happens is, uh, so you already checked, so you don't want uh, to recheck it. Again. No, no, we don't want to check it now. So what the data suggests is clearly that endoscopic uh, glue versus uh, US guided coil plus glue. We have recently uh, uh, done a study, multi-center study. So that has shown that uh, US guided coil plus glue is definitely superior in a sense that although the initial procedure cost will be high. But what happens is the rebleeding rates are much, much lower. And as a result, the patient requires much lower requirements of repeat endoscopies. And in, in a sense, that will decrease the overall cost. It decreases the risk of rebleeding. Yes, yes also. definitely. definitely. So one procedure compared to four or five even in large viruses. So hmm. we recommend it for large viruses, Absolutely. Not, huh. not for small. Not for small viruses. Yes. So any any varics, maybe around Dr. Kapil, I think F2, F3, large varics, which you can see on, on endoscopic view, it is better to always do yeah. the US because US will give a much better idea of the size of the varix and also about the collaterals that are there. And then we can kind of go ahead with uh, yeah. uh, coil and glue and whatever that we decide. Any varix more than 10 millimeter, we call it large. Uh -huh. so, so that is so we, that we uh, consider as this. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, sir. So one more thing that I want to uh, highlight over here is that... Uh, in these situations, what happens is uh, two or three things has to be kept in mind. One is that you are even when the varix is large, let's say a three centimeter or four centimeter varix, it is the number of coils that we increase, right? So what we do is we decide the size, the maximum size of the coil diameter that is available is a two centimeter coil. Mm -hmm. So so you, you have to pack the varix with multiple number of coils of two centimeter. So what you go is you go distance. First go to the distal part. And then gradually pull your back your needle, like, just like here I did. I pushed to the distal part, but since this varix was completely covered with one coil enough, that was okay. If it was, if it was a large one, you come back gradually by uh, deploying coils, coils one after the other. That becomes a uh, large scaffold. And then you inject the glue, but the glue is always, I think, one to two ml, maximum three yeah. ml. Yes, Dr. Kapil, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. And, and in which cases you won't recommend US guided? Get okay, ha, ha. that's a very interesting question. I think I think that is what Dr. Kapil was also telling that when any varix, uh, where you find that the that the endoscopically the varix is an F2 and F3 varix, I think we should uh, go ahead straight away with an US assessment, see what what has to be done. Sometimes what happens is it, like this varix where there is a small amount of honeycombing pattern is there, mm -hmm. rather than injecting into every of these varices, it's better that we uh, inject in the perforator like this we did. But other than that, if there is a large varix, let's say more than uh, 1.2, 1.5 centimeter varix. So in which case, you will not use a US. You will not use a US masking. If you, in which any case? Any case, I will not even use an US. Maybe a small F1 varix. I, th I think any. I think large, you see a large varix uh -huh. and you will not use No, but then th this is a very tricky question. So, so what he's trying to say is if there are large shunts, yeah. so then in those situations, probably, yes, you send the patient up front for a BRTO or 
for a sun surgery so rather than HPS. Yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. So do you do a CT prior to? Uh, no, not when... always. I think I think that should be a protocol. The moment you see a large varix, I think the protocol should be get a CT, look for the shunts adequately, and then kind of go ahead with an US. I think that should be the protocol that yeah. we should follow. The CT, yes. we should have an anatomy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just like a just like a ERCP. Yes, we yes. always or a we do MRCP <clears throat> or a US prior to that to see what is the how should we plan the procedure. Correct, absolutely. I think I think that's so that CT should sense. be done as a mm. photovenous anatomy should be. Available to you, suppose yes. the patient has multiple shunts. I would not uh, recommend no, putting, putting not. a coil or a glue. Mm -hmm. Second is patient. Suppose patient uh, doesn't have a LR shunt. Uh -huh. So what will you do? Do if the, your US procedure fails? Then the patient goes for once the LR shunt is not there. Then the patient goes for either a. So so, so in those cases we uh -huh. we recommend tips plus uh -huh. carto uh -huh. or carto. Okay. Achha, okay. So we because I, I will I have a talk on that I will show you. Yeah. So huh. suppose patient has a predominantly right sided system. Okay. Uh, a right sided mm -hmm. photovenous system. Doctor Kapil. Yes. I am audible. Doctor Kapil. Yes, sir. Doctor Puri. Yes. So if the patient is bleeding, then you don't look for the shunt or so at that yes. time because yes, it sir, is sir. an emergency but, situation. Yes, sir. We are discussing ideal so, case, sir. I think so in that scenario, dis number one, number second. If you look at the BRTO, the cost goes to the 2.5 lakhs. Right, sir. We are not talking about always be the government institution. Then you require uh -huh. an expertise also. Uh -huh. So there are so many factors which are going to decide that what is a better choice. And uh, there is a no head-to-head -head comparison between the BRTO or endoscopy glue versus uh, yes, uh, US. US. The only thing is Good. US coil and glue always reduce the chances of embolism and I think help in the complete solidification because when there's a large shunt, the chances of the glue embolization is very high. Absolutely. Even if you are doing endoscopically or with an EUS guided, mm -hmm. because the large shunt, it just migrate out. So, uh, it will all depend upon the situation. I think that's a very good so, point made, Dr. Rajesh. Because what happens is in cases of large shunts, even the turbulence of the blood is very high. So even when we have seen that the moment we push a glue a coil, the, even before a glue or anything, the coil swivels away. Yeah, very, very, very important point, uh, Dr. Samantha. In that case, what you do mm -hmm. when you release the coil, the part of the coil you can release outside yes. the gut yes. lumen, yes. inside the gut lumen. Absolutely. So that is going to prevent. Yes. That's very number second. If you see in the in the varics, there are septa most of the time. Uh -huh. So you leave the part of the coil across one septa and the part of the coil on in the other side of the septa. Absolutely. This is going yes. to help to prevent. So I think it is individual individualization depending upon the circumstances, mm -hmm. depending upon the availability of expertise. Every case is and separate. I think you should yes. take a call. Yes, sir. Absolutely correct. So no, I think it's it's probably the it's okay, we can put some. I'm not sure if that's the source of the problem. Uh, so I think we should shift so on to the next one. Normally we are done with yes. Thank you everybody.